Hello, I'm James Gilchrist, Director of Lighthouse L&D Consulting. And on behalf of ClearPath Learning Group, I'd like to welcome you to a very special program. Today I'll be talking on Zoom with ClearPath founder and CEO, Jen Kammerdiener, and Guy Wallace, founder of Epic, to discover how their learning and development philosophies and practices have helped hundreds of companies provide measurably better learning experiences for their employees. Whether you're an L&D specialist just starting your career, a well-established instructional designer, or a business leader looking for the best learning solutions for your employees, we hope the conversation, stories, and wisdom shared today will inspire you on your journey. So without further ado, let's dive in and meet our guests. Guy Wallace got started in L&D back in 1979 after graduating with a degree in radio, TV, and film. After working with Wix Lumber and then Motorola, he became an instructional systems design consultant in 1982 and has since worked for over 80 clients on several hundred ISD projects. He and his teams have won awards for their work with AT&T, Change Healthcare, General Motors, Hewlett Packard, Imperial Oil, and Siemens Building Technologies. In 2010, Guy was the recipient of the International Society for Performance Improvement's highest award, Honorary Member for Life. In 2021, he was recognized by Thrive as one of the top 20 influencers in L&D in the U.S. And in January 2023, he was recognized as a top 100 learning influencer by the Copenhagen-based e-learning and LMS provider Eduflow. Welcome to the program, Guy. Thank you, James. Thanks for inviting me. Jen Kammerdiener spent the first 15 years of her career building upon her methods of learning strategy, instructional design, and curriculum architecture in the financial services industry, which is where she met Guy, and we'll hear more about that in a bit. Jen launched ClearPath in 2009 with a vision to bring her performance-based approach to companies of all shapes and sizes across every industry. Since then, she and her teams have been doing just that, and they've developed a reputation as the gold standard in our industry for bringing calm to chaos, seeing the big picture, and identifying what teams, leaders, and individuals in an organization need in order to perform and move the business to its desired state. Welcome, Jen. Thank you, James. It's so good to be here with you and with my friend and mentor, Guy Wallace. Thank you. Guy, you've authored over 30 books focused on L&D-related topics, and it seems like performance-based learning and development takes center stage in much of what you teach and say. Would you agree? And if so, can you tell us a bit about this philosophy and why it's important? Yes, thanks. The performance focus, performance orientation is very critical in enterprise learning and development. One of the things I learned back in 1979, really on my first day in the job out of college, was from lessons from Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert and Bob Mager and Joe Harless, four thought leaders way back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and what I learned is that the, the need was to focus on the performance requirements of the learners back on the job. So we need to understand you know, what their performance requirements are and how they are measured. Now, people are on the payroll to produce outputs and they do that by performing tasks and to perform tasks, they need to have certain knowledge and skills. So we begin with the end in mind, the performance outputs, and we need to understand who are the stakeholders for that output, downstream customers, regulators, our own management, our, our fellow workers, and what are the requirements for that output? And the same is true with task performance. There are perhaps different stakeholders that are more concerned with the tasks that are performed than with the outputs. So we need to understand that whole picture of performance, the outputs, the tasks, and the stakeholder requirements. And from there, we can understand the measures that we are trying to impact with learning and development products, whether those are performance guides or learning experiences. Um, so once we have a clear picture of that, we can systematically derive what the knowledge and skills are and then we can begin to look at what existing content we might already have and whether or not it'd be appropriate to reuse it as is or after modification. Um, I've taught this, my approach to 
literally hundreds of people, uh, my business partners, my staff, and the staff of my clients. And that's how I kind of met Jen in, in terms of, you know, coming together on this performance orientation. 1979, I'm, I'm thinking you have seen so many different landscapes come and go in the L&D field. Um, it's, it's really incredible to get to hear what was going on at that point in your career. Uh, thank you, Jen. I know you embrace this performance-based model. Can you share an example demonstrating how you've applied it either personally or at ClearPath? Yes, absolutely. In case, in, in fact, this is what ClearPath is based on, James. Um, you know, prior to even meeting Guy or launching ClearPath Learning Group, I had spent, as you mentioned, 15 years um, in the learning space and that was in financial services. And in those days, um, I really, you know, I was a curious learner myself and a curious performer. And so I intentionally was making moves in and out of the business constantly, you know, learning how to lead in the call center environment, then learning how to train, as we called it then, right, in the call center environment, and then maybe leading a learning group or leading and going back into the business and learning how do we do this in mortgage, for example. So even within that financial services space, I was moving around learning the performance of the business intentionally, right? Um, knowing that uh, my, my skills and gifts were in helping others learn how to do the work, I wanted to study the business that we were helping those learners and performers to do. So years prior to founding ClearPath, um, this philosophy was already building in me. Uh, and then when we formed ClearPath, which is was actually just after meeting Guy, uh, we chose the name ClearPath Learning Group. I guess in my mind, it would be obvious that organizations would be thinking about the performance outcomes of the roles in their care, right? And how those outcomes directly tie to their business outcomes, and then how learning should be designed in the right path for the learner to achieve that desired state performance. So that seemed obvious to me at the time, and but I can tell you now with almost 15 years in on the other side, um, that it still actually isn't isn't obvious. And often we are called in to solve something that is uh, defined kind of as a learning need or a training need. Um, and that gives us the opportunity, right, to go in and assess what is the actual performance outcome that we're looking for and then bring the right solution. So Guy and I are absolutely aligned on this. And this is the basis for ClearPath Learning Group. I, I love hearing that bit about how what seems like an obvious point to make, what seems like what you'd have to do to accomplish what you're setting out to accomplish isn't obvious, especially to those who are closest right. to the work, closest to uh, the, 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 the problem at hand. Uh, it's almost, um, it's like knowledge blindness, right? Uh, so anyway, that's, that's, that's great to hear you talk about that. And it certainly sounds like, um, clear path is, uh, on the right path <laughs> as far as leading people to, uh, finding the solutions they actually need. Um, so let, let's switch gears for just a second. Um, uh, guy has mentioned meeting you, you alluded to meeting guy, Jen, I know from hearing you talk about guy that you consider him to be a mentor. What do you remember about how you and he met? I love this memory, James, because I was, um, you know, we're, we're kind of splitting my career into these two 15-year-ish, you know, phases toward the end of those first 15 years after really studying, studying people, studying performance, studying how do we make learning work for the roles um, in our care that we're really trying to push performance um, and, and achieve performance for. Uh, I was already sort of working this methodology and I had my color-coded spreadsheets and I had like this method, you know, that I was looking at all of the roles and how did their jobs break down and what were the different learning pieces, what were the core pieces, right, that the whole group needed and then which were the pieces that were going to drive certain performance areas for different uh, specific roles. And so when I heard that Guy Wallace was coming into our organization to be a leader, I think I was the first in line uh, to meet him. I had done some research to kind of figure out who this new leader was going to be. And when I read some of his material, I thought, this man has written the book um, that I've been trying to figure out, right? <laughs> he's he's already written it. So I was first in line to want to meet him. And uh, when I did, you know, I always say that when I met Guy, 
it gave me the confirmation that the path I was on was right, that this performance way of looking at um, learning and development and driving business results through performance was the right way to look at things. And then after working with Guy, which really was only a short period of time until our world changed again, but after that, I had the confidence, you know, to go out and to move out into other industries, which is exactly what we did with ClearPath and took that same methodology and same approach uh, based on performance. And uh, I knew I was able to do that at that point because it was right, right? And we had worked it across the financial services world and we were able now to go out and uh, and help learners and performers in whatever roles across industries. And that's that's what we've done. So anyway, my, my memory of meeting Guy was at a really pivotal point in my career and in the foundation of our company. Well, it sounds like that meeting uh, if not faded, certainly had a lot to do with the direction that you felt confident going in in the days, weeks, months, and years ahead. Would you say that's true? I would agree. For me, it was, it was as I mentioned, it was a pivotal point. Um, it was a point that brought both confirmation and confidence, right, to move forward in that direction. And, and Guy has been a support in the background ever since. So uh, while we haven't been working super closely together since then, um, he's always been around. And my team will tell you that his name comes up I, almost daily. So when we're working as a team, so ClearPath is a, is a team of practitioners working, and we talk about how we're approaching our work, and we do approach our work with various methods, and we've adopted the best of the best along the way, you know, so we pull together methods around agile ways of working and design thinking and lean ISD from Guy Wallace, right, and other pieces that we've picked up along the way in our work. Um, and so we, that's, that's how ClearPath works. That's the magic of ClearPath is that we're focused on these best of the best methods that bring about performance and help businesses move to their preferred desired state. And so we use Guy, well, Guy, we use your name every day in case your ears are burning. <laughs> You're that important to us. I love hearing about how the, there are learning and development principles and also business fundamentals that are so linked and being used all the time to make sure that you're achieving the results that you're you're looking for. Um, I'd say it's lucky for both your clients that you met when you did. Uh, so over to you, Guy, how would you describe the moment when your paths converged? Yeah, so it was uh, in late uh, 2007. I'd been a consultant for 25 years. And I, I was enticed to get off the uh, travel treadmill by someone who had been in one of my client organizations back in 1986 and seven and, and through 94. But uh, this woman who was part of my client organization had moved on and advanced in her career and she became a leader at the bank where Jen and I met. And she had enticed me to come in and she had asked me specifically if I would implement and put in place my approach to curriculum architecture design which is a performance oriented approach to modular curricula or learning content, if you will. And so I did that. Um, and uh, timing is everything, of course, and the uh, financial industry kind of went in the tank in uh, 2008. And uh, so I, I wasn't really able to make much progress uh, because of all the changes going on. I was supposed to have 85 people reporting to me and I didn't get them for eight months. But I had met Jen. She had sent me an email uh, welcoming me into the organization and expressing how excited she was to be able to work with me. And I already had a new organization design uh, because of my conversation with the, with the person that brought me in. And I was going to have four managers and the rest of the 80 people would report into three of those four managers. But I wanted somebody who was going to be what I was calling the chief curriculum architect to help me install this methodology. And so all the processes and all the tools and all the techniques that are part of this, something I've been training clients at Amico and General Motors and Eli Lilly and uh, back before I joined the bank. And so, but Jen was already up that learning and performance curve. She already had a mindset for this. So it wasn't something that she needed to be convinced of. So we began to work together and put in place how we were going to go about doing this. 
And then the bottom fell out. And our bank was sold by the Federal Reserve to a different bank. Mm -hmm. And and so I had to, I, Jen left, uh, I think, uh, maybe before that ended or shortly thereafter. It was a tumultuous time. And uh, I waited to see what the new regime was, was going to think about these methods and this approach and whether or not they would want me to continue to do that. Well, make a, a long story short, they didn't. And so I waited uh, until it was time for me to leave and then I re-entered the consulting world. But but so our paths crossed in terms of this performance orientation and looking at putting in place a modular curriculum architecture uh, where you would have content that was specifically oriented to people's performance on the job, the outputs and the tasks, and the knowledge and skills. But you'd also be looking at what's the shareable content here? What do most people need or all people need? And, and do they use that all in a similar fashion, similar tasks for similar outputs? Or is there use of that knowledge and skill that's shareable for different ends? different tasks and different outputs. So you can begin to reduce the cost of putting in place performance-oriented uh, instruction or training or learning, and, and that was our goal. So we were of like mind, and uh, I guess she's gone off and, and done this with her company, and that's all good. Uh, I, that, that's a tremendous amount of uh, insight uh, that we're getting into what it was like to be having those conversations with business leaders at a tumultuous time, right? Uh, I think some of our viewers are thinking that right now is a tumultuous time in the learning and development space and the technology space. Um, I'm thinking a couple of things that came out for me hearing that. Um, one was, uh, of course, what happens in, in your industry has a potentially a huge impact on the resources you're given to do the job. And that can be headcount, uh, it can be budgets. And uh, I felt very fortunate at around that same time that you were talking about 2008 and just after, um, that I had come into contact with a learning leader who was very forward thinking in terms of making the learning and development department a business, uh, a for-profit and a uh, a business um, enhancing department. It wasn't just about the philosophy of training and why it was important. It was how are we concretely saving this company money? How are we improving efficiencies? How are we reducing risks? How can we show on a spreadsheet at the end of a quarter and at the end of the year what our department has done to earn a seat at the table, right? And if you're inside a company, at least you have champions and people that you can talk to and hopefully, you know, get the ball rolling in the direction you want. But as consultants, it's it's that much more difficult, right? You, you kind of have to find that one person that's going to see eye to eye with you and be interested in bringing your methodology in. Um, so anyway, that just you brought up so much stuff for me. I felt I felt like I needed to to weigh in a little bit, but uh, but that's that's really great stuff. And I think uh, overcoming challenges, uh, making connections, and helping to negotiate the value of L and D inside a business is those are all things that are going to be important no matter what era you're in. Um, okay, so so I want to go back to something that you brought up uh, briefly a moment ago. Um, I know also from our time preparing for this video that you believe strongly in what you call performance guides. So how do performance guides differ from other types of learning solutions and when might instructional designers want to develop them? So this is something that goes back to my very first day out of college back on the job in a learning and development organization. And I was given a, this was 1979 and I was given a newsletter from the Praxis organization from 1970. And Praxis was a consulting firm by my mentors, the late Gary Rumler and the late Tom Gilbert. But they talked about guidance, the short way home. Well, by 1979, nine years later, guidance was known more popularly as job aids. And soon it became known as electronic performance support systems or quick reference guides, informal SOPs, performance support, and nowadays it's more familiar to many of you as workflow learning. Although 
learning is not always the ends of the use of what I call performance guides. Now, when the performance context demands a memorized performance response, because there's no time to look anything up, you use, you train people, you develop their performance competence through learning experiences. And th they've got to memorize that. They've got to have that at the ready. When the performance context demands they use it, they have to have a memorized performance response. But in my experience as a consultant, I would say that 70 to 80% or even more times, you, you don't need to have things committed to memory. You can refer to, to something to give a referenced performance response. And whether you call it job aids or performance support or or performance guides, the intent is to guide performance. Let somebody follow a list of steps, whether there's branching in that or not, whether there's situational things that they need to be aware of to decide which branch to go down. But it's really all about enabling performance through a performance guide or learning experiences. And they all have to be oriented to what's the performance of the individual. So one size approaches don't work. You can't give me a skill and not teach me how to apply it in my specific work processes or work streams or workflows. It's one of the issues we have in the business is that our language is all convoluted and overlapping and et cetera. But, but so whatever you call these things here, our goal is to enable people to perform on the job through a memorized response or a reference response. Um, so this, this was really critical. I'll, I'll tell a quick story about this. Back in 1979, when I joined Wix Lumber in Saginaw, Michigan, I joined the program development department. There was a 10 people in the training services organization in total, and there were three of us in program development. And my boss and my coworker were brand new to the organization. They'd come from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Detroit, where they had worked with Gary Rumler's brother. And, and so we were all tied to this Rumler, Gary Rumler approach to things. Um, but so their intent, they said, read this, this newsletter because that's what we're going to do. We're going to call it job aids. And that's what we're going to do that instead of training. Well, our clients hated that. They were expecting training. And here we were handing out, you know, laminated job aids for people. And that just wasn't acceptable to the clients. So we did what, what I generally refer to as sneaky trick number 47 we embedded job aids into the training so that the learners who are performers had what they needed to go perform on the job. And our clients were happy that we had done traditional training. So there's many ways to do this. And sometimes you, you can use standalone job aids or performance guides, but sometimes you embed them into a learning experience and teach people how to use them because of the high risks or high rewards at stake. Um, but but so the goal is to reduce this demand that we put on people that they memorize everything. And that's not necessary. That's not needed. And that's a wasted resource. And if I have some job to do, like the doing the annual inventory, well, I'm not going to remember that. I'm not going to commit that to memory. You need to give me some guidance so that I can do that. And if I use the guidance often enough, if it was how to do a typical transaction at a cash register... I might eventually memorize that by using this reference materials. Um, but if the job doesn't demand it, and if it will allow me to use that reference materials, well, then that's what we should use. We shouldn't try to force people to memorize everything because memories are faulty. And if, if it's something that they don't do often enough, we're going to have to do space learning. Now we're increasing the expense to try to enable performance when we could have given somebody a simple job aid or performance guide and let them use that in their workflow, in their work stream, in their work processes. Jen, um, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on that. I, I feel like everything I've read and learned about ClearPath shows the importance that you place on partnering with your clients. And this topic strikes me as one that would be near and dear to your heart, right? This topic brings up so much for me. I'll try to <laughs> try to be concise here. Um, what strikes me the most about what Guy was just explaining is that there is so much language around this. And these phrases and terms are also interpreted differently. 
depending on the type of organization you're working with. So that to me is one of the keys um, here is that, you know, when we, I mentioned we launched into ClearPath and then we took this performance-based approach out across the industries. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, we were so fortunate because our first experiences landed us inside some of the larger uh, professional services firms that you would recognize who are also out serving clients, right, with different solutions and solving. for. So we were, you know, sort of catapulted into this uh, highly professional environment um, where we have clients in that space who are very open to concepts like the learner journey, right, if you, if you want to use that phrase, right, and they're very comfortable with the idea that we have this iterative experience and we have a learner starting in one place and learning and then practicing and then getting some feedback and then iterating on that, right? That's an easy sell in that kind of environment, right? And then also in those same years, we were going into other spaces like highly regulated industries. We had come out of a highly regulated industry, financial services, right? Where Everything is very specific, but still there was sometimes this approach of giving everybody the same training for everything. And so you we're constantly right trying to reel that in, guy. Um, so other highly regulated industries always feel like we have to give everyone everything and there's going to be an audit, right? So that's the mindset there. And then we worked our way into, you know, other completely different industries. So we're talking about medical device, we're talking about retail, we're talking about big tech. Um, now we are working with some supply chain companies, you know, so it's all over the place in terms of how different types of companies view learning and performance and what they think their need might be in order to meet those needs and the words that we use, right? And the phrases that we use to describe that. So I would say that that's an area where those of us who have really lived and breathed this over the last couple of decades, we've learned how to uh, incorporate the right language. We always say that we're clear path and we meet our clients wherever they are on this path, right? So they, they are in a certain place and it's like, know your audience, right? So you need to understand what the client's mindset is based on what type of an organization they are and what is driving their need. Is it audits? Is it letting everyone have a journey? Is it, you know, operational targets? Is it KPIs? And you really have to go there first. And when you go there first, then you can help with the conversation about the right learning or performance or instructional material, instructional guides, I think is what Guy calls that, um, to meet that performance need. So this is a process uh, that we work through. Uh, we we can talk a little bit more later about how we do this. And we have kind of two pieces of the puzzle at ClearPath, one being the strategy side of this and the other being the actual production of those materials after we've reached the right conclusion through the strategy work. So that's that's kind of how we handle this. Um, but I thought it was really interesting to think about, you know, all of the language around this. In fact, we, um, I don't think we took this language from you guys. Maybe we did. If we did, you claim it back now. But we learned along the way to develop this, what we call an attribute analysis process to even help clients understand. So for example, if you're calling us because you want us to build e-learning on A, B, and C, is e-learning the right, does it have the right attributes to drive the performance for what you're looking for, um, right? Or is this something that's, you know, it's going to change every six months? Or is this something that's a longer term where you actually need some foundational learning first and then some intermediate learning, et cetera? So we do a good bit of that attribute analysis work around if you're requesting this type of instructional guide or type of training, let's analyze that against what you're looking to get out of it. And that seems to work well, that process as well. So yes, there's uh we could go on and on all day about this. <laughs> about yeah, this. To, to your point about the, I think it, you need to encourage clients to look at their life cycle costs for blended learning. If they're going to use one set of modes or media, um, what are the life cycle implications? What is the shelf life of the knowledge and skill or the tasks or the equipment that's being used. So there's many factors to look at. And so when I do uh, knowledge and skill analysis, one thing we're looking at is what's the volatility of that content? Is it highly volatile, medium or low or zero? You know, if it's active listening, that's been good since the days of Socrates. So you, so you can treat things differently because when you package something, there's an inherent cost for the development and the life cycle maintenance of that. 
And you don't want to put something that's highly volatile into video because that's expensive to update. So you need to look for the the right approach, the right mode, group paced, self-paced, or coached, and, and the media that you're using because there's cost implications there. And that affects the return on investment for clients investing in learning for the sake of performance. I find myself thinking often about how, depending on your relationship, whether it's pre-existing or new with a client, they may be coming to you because they have an expectation that you're the, the, the guy or the company that does X. You know, you do videos, you do e-learning, you do whatever it is. Um, and they think that's what they want. And so they've come to you. And if in the course of that analysis and that conversation about attributes and so forth, you discover that, well, to better serve the client, what they need is something else, then that's a whole nother layer of human contact, human conversation, relationship building, trust building that has to factor in. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's not an exact science, but there's a lot of science in it. You know, you just can't take the human element out so much stuff oh my god all the terms you just laid out uh yes and why is it that we keep changing our language uh this is an age-old <laughs> issue here the the language that's used i think that this makes it much more difficult for new people coming in uh because there's been this proliferation of language here vendors change the language to to make their stuff seem new and different when it perhaps is not um but so this is challenging and and but when you're speaking to your clients, my advice is talk in the language of your clients. Use their business language. Save your L&D jargon for conferences and your professional networks. But the clients don't want to understand or learn how we make the sausage. They just want the sausage that's going to help them. So, And how we do that and all the details and all the nuances is something that they're perhaps not interested in until they see that it works. My experience is that clients are very interested in how we did that because they want to see that replicated by their other sources for similar kinds of services. I love the idea of learning the language of your client and speaking to them in the terms that they understand and not pushing your jargon on people, right? That's, that's great advice. Um, and again, it also reflects how every aspect of the job is first and foremost a human relationship aspect right you're it's the humans are who you're training humans who are buying the training you know uh humans are the ones that are either going to decide they like working with you or not you know it's yeah. so that's all all very key um well so so i want to move on now to another one of your philosophies guy and and this uh, this, I think, is one of my favorites because I'm a big fan of using what's there, right? Not reinventing the wheel if there are solutions already in place or helpers already in place at, at an organization that can work with you. Um, you talk about the importance of leveraging master performers. Uh, to me, this speaks to the importance of understanding the context, the environment, the entire learner's journey when developing a learning solution. From your vantage point as both a thought leader and a performance analyst, describe what you refer to as facilitating a group process. Yes. Uh, so uh, my story where this started was I was working at Wix Lumber. This was 1979. I was doing a video script. I was on my seventh iteration. It was extremely frustrating. It was a product video on Windows, and we had five different vendors for windows to Wix Lumber uh, with 183 uh, lumber centers across North America. And so our job was to teach our sales staff how to sell windows, how to ask the right questions, how to you know get the right sizes, all of the specifics here, how to upgrade them from you know single pane to double pane windows, et cetera. And on my seventh iteration of this, I had gotten in a bunch of feedback from these vendors with with edits to my script and one of them was having me change the to the and the to the and it was a mess and i stormed into my boss's boss's office simply because my boss wasn't there to listen to me complain and i walked into the director's office and i said that's it i'm not updating this script one more time this is what they're doing to me and he had 
been in my job in the past, so he kind of understood this. And I said, I would like to bring all these vendors into our conference room and spend two days and hammer this out and be done with it. And he thought that was perhaps a good idea. So we checked with our marketing department, who was our client for this, uh, trying to help uh, all of us sell more windows. And they agreed to do this, but the vendors pushed back and said, oh, well, the Justice Department will think we're colluding and setting prices or whatever. So we have to record the entire two days of this. We brought them in. We did this. I hammered it out. I facilitated them. It was a very tough facilitation because each one of them was trying to put in their favorite marketing phrases into my script. And the others would say, oh, no, that's got to come out. And so I was able to do away with all of that nonsense and get a script. And then we produced a storyboard and then made the videos, et cetera. So that was my facilitated group process. I had said, oh, my goodness, for short-term pain, what a huge gain. I can shorten the cycle time if I just bring the right people together. So who do I want to bring together to do this? And so I started doing this with my next job at Motorola as well. I brought in teams of people. And I would I remember asking my 30 manufacturing operations managers at Motorola that I told them that I wanted to, to, to address their project that they had given me. I did my best active listing so they knew I understood what they were looking for. And I said, okay, I want to do this analysis and I want to bring in uh, these exemplar performers. And they said, exemplars? Guy, we hate that word. That's a $3 college word. And I said, well, how about master performers? They said, oh, okay, we can live with that. So So I had them identify the top master performers related to the performance we were going to affect. And... And then there were other subject matter experts. You know, we in the business deal with subject matter experts, but I call them master performers if they have known to be uh, able to perform at a level of mastery. But there are sometimes other people with other voices that need to be heard from also, maybe regulatory affairs or the quality organization or the law department, whomever. Sometimes it's downstream customers or whether that's internal of the company or external. So uh, my goal is to facilitate using a group process to generate the analysis data and also work with groups to produce designs. So master performers, other subject matter experts, sometimes I bring in supervisors of the target audience, sometimes I bring in novice performers because what I've seen in the past is that sometimes the master performers may all have 20, 30 years experience. They have no clue as to what it's like to be a new person just coming into the job. And so when you move from analysis where you're defining what are the outputs, what are the measures, what are the tasks, what are the measures, what are the knowledge and skills, and you move into design, how you affect the design is most critical when you have the voice of novice performers who are recently new, but have climbed the performance and learning curve a bit and have a sense for what do you need first, second, and third rather than rely on people who've been in the job for 30 years trying to make those decisions as you sort your analysis data and sequence it to effective design. So that's that's what the group process is all about. In 1984, my consulting firm, Partners and I, wrote two articles. One of them got published in Training Magazine and the other one in the NSPI, which is now ISPI, in their Performance Improvement Journal. And this was about doing a group process to generate the analysis data. And the second article was about using group process to create a curriculum architecture design. So all this goes way back into the late 70s. And it's very, what we would give clients a choice is that you can bring a group together and in three days we can be done with the analysis of an entire job. We'll know all the enabling knowledge and skills, And then we'll take that data, review that with the client and the stakeholders, and then we'll go into a design effort with the same master performers or a subset of those same master performers, and we'll create a design. And then you can approve that after you're reviewing it, and then we can get on with developing it, and we can reuse existing content or create new content as necessary. And that'll take X amount of time. Now, if we do the more traditional thing where we're doing... uh, interviews and observations and document reviews and then producing analysis data 
and reviewing it with people. Well, generally you go through di different cycles of edits, like the video script where you're doing this seven to eight times or whatever, and then you go into design. If you bring people all together in a room, you can make <laughs> decisions in a more timely fashion and get people to argue out their differences and maybe discover that it's really language. You're calling it the, they're calling it the, hey, it's the same thing. And, and so that's very eye-opening and you get greater buy-in from the master performers and other subject matter experts for what that instruction, what that training, what that learning will be at some point. And this is eye-opening for them. And what I've learned from all of that is that that group process engages the master performers. They want to stick around and be involved in the development of the content. And clients have said, oh, they're not going to want to do that because they're tired of this. They want to get back to the job. No, we're talking about their jobs and using their expertise and packaging it so we can help others. Their egos will demand that they participate. They'll demand to participate. And so that's, that's very eye-opening. And so this, so I've even done development using a facilitated group process where I bring in multiple experts on the job, those master performers, and hammer out that content. Um, to make sure that it's as accurate, as complete, and appropriate as we can possibly get it before we go pilot test it, make sure that we've worked out all the bugs before we release it to everybody. Just in that segment, you delivered a clinic uh, for instructional designers and learning specialists uh, having to figure out the best approach to take to getting the different stages of a project done. That analysis stage uh, understanding that they didn't, they need not be married to one approach and that they need to understand the people involved, where the information is kept. Is the documentation the best place to find it? Or if you, after spending six weeks reviewing it, are you going to discover that there's three or four individuals who've been arguing before you came along to how that stuff needed to be changed, right? So go to the people, go to the people with opinions first. And they will, in they will, as you, I think you alluded to this, they'll hash out their differences and they'll take each other's credibility. They have credibility with each other, right? Whereas you may not have the, that credibility. You'll, you'll get to sit in and hear how a conversation gets worked out that's going to save you weeks and you know, days and weeks in a process and you don't have to say a thing, right? It's so insightful when you hear the nuances of the conversation with pe between people arguing it out. And what most often I had coined this phrase here, I don't know if I probably borrowed from somebody else, but heated agreements where people are arguing and eventually they turn to me and go, oh, never mind, we're good. Where it was just a language semantics issue. Um, but another thing that I learned about this is back to my Motorola example is that with another client group within Motorola, I, I, I tended to, to do analysis reports and design documents and put the names on the cover page of all the people who participated in this. So my client would know you know, where did this come from? Because guy doesn't do that job for a living. How would he know? So who did he work with to get this? And I had, I, I distributed 20 binders for, for, with an analysis report. And the head person looked at the front page and threw the binder across the room. So the lesson, my takeaway was, you better ask the client who they want you to work with. Now, one, they can make that happen then. So you're no longer begging for resources and people to give you content and review things. So I started asking my clients to handpick the people, the places to observe performance, the documents to review. I wanted them to point me at the specific resources that I would use as sources for my next set of steps and outputs. And I, I, I found that that is critical. Of all of my consulting projects, hundreds of them, the ones that failed were where my client refused to engage their own stakeholders to identify the resources that we should use. And that's led to disaster. Plus, there's no buy-in from the from the managers of the target audience to get the, make sure that the content is being used or that other issues that we've uncovered are addressed. And when it comes time to implement your, your instruction or your learning, and you find you're not getting people to participate to take it, it's because their managers haven't seen the value in it. And so one of the tricks of this trade is to engage those stakeholders so that the managers can see what you're producing and how it's going to impact them. Because as stakeholders, 
They're the ones who live with the consequences of us doing really good work that improves performance or has the potential to versus doing a load of stuff. And, and so getting them engaged in this, working in a group process with the client and the key stakeholders is just another way to work with humans and establish a relationship and give the clients options. When, when I work with clients, I talk to them about, you know, I'm offering you a command and control ability for this project so you can command and control me. But on the other hand, that empowers me to do this work on your behalf. And so when I ask you for the resources that I need, I need the top drawer, the top people, the top examples, and I need them and their timely participation. And if I don't get that, the schedule will slip and you won't get what you need when you need it. So the the I put the onus on them and it's a partnership, it's a collaboration with them. So working with people in groups make gets better decisions. Yeah, it can be painful when they don't agree initially and you've got to work through that and as a facilitator, as as the person who's trying to move the project and the effort along, that's sometimes challenging for some of us. But but if you have those capabilities to do that, you can work with clients in the most collaborative way throughout all of the whatever your process is, Addy or Addy like or whatever. But but it's really about how you work with them and get the best from them. And and they need to be able to see that you're you're producing good stuff. So it's really all about the analysis data. If you can't use a facilitated group process and you have to do the traditional route of individual interviews and observations and document reviews, it's really all about generating the right data so that you are crystal clear about these are the outputs people are the payroll to produce. This is how you can tell a good one from a bad one. And when clients begin to see that kind of an insight, that performance orientation in the data, that builds their confidence and excitement for what you're doing on their behalf. Jen, I, I wanna give you a chance now to weigh in on some of that. I mean, obviously, uh, a guy unpacked a lot, but uh, we started off talking about that, um, the, the master performers um, and leveraging uh, multiple ways of working as far as getting at the information you need and, and utilizing the resources at the company. Um, so I'll ask you, in your role as the lead practitioner for ClearPath, how, how often have you recommended this approach when developing solutions for your clients? And follow up, have you ever used that line of guys that uh, when he said, uh, the only projects that fail are the ones where I am unable to get access to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as a way of, you know, helping to make the case so you have that many fewer projects that fail. Go, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to try to answer both of those questions. Before I do that, though, I just have to say I'm just I'm always amazed just at Guy's ability to remember everything that ever happened ever <laughs> in his life. I don't have that. I don't have that ability. And uh, my father-in-law was that way and fascinating. Um, never forgets anything, never forgets any interaction, you know, that he ever had with people. And so I absolutely love listening to guys' stories. Anyone who listens to this podcast will now know how ClearPath learned to do everything that we do. And they'll be calling you, Guy. They'll be calling you, wanting to learn more from you. But um, the memories are fantastic. And so I will answer your questions, James. But every time Guy starts a story with 1979... <laughs> it takes me back to where I was in 1979, and this is gonna this is going to date me, though we already have with the with the career phases. But um, I was sitting in a, in the third grade. I was in third grade, sitting in my third grade class in 1979 when Guy was off establishing his career, and I can't help but think of this every time you talk about this master performer approach because uh it was fascinating third grade east tennessee which is where we live now we've lived many other places since then and we've returned here um and i was in a small elementary school and we were getting ready to receive um some families from another country and the families did not speak english and my sweet sweet teacher at the time um selected an unusual approach for teaching the students that she was going to receive into her classroom. So instead of bringing them into the classroom setting and teaching them English the way that she would teach all of us English, she said, I would like you, you, and you to stay after school and meet with me. She had candy bars and I would do anything for a candy bar in those days. 
not now, but then I would do anything for a candy bar. So I stayed behind and I was on this little special committee. And as she explained what she was doing, we realized she had selected us, Guy, because we were masters of the English language in her classroom, right? And so she was going to have us decide and determine how these kids from this other country could learn how to speak like third graders rather than her trying to teach book English and do it in the midst of the larger classroom. How fascinating. How smart was she? So I think about that every time Guy tells his 1979 story about how he was putting together master performers. I was actually experiencing that on the other side of it as a child in a learning setting where my teacher identified that that would be the better way to have these other students actually learn our language is to learn it from us by reading with us and speaking with us. Fascinating. So I just thought that would be a fun fact, James, to throw in there. And now, so fast forwarding, I agree that this is one of the tricks of the trade that I would I would credit Guy that for teaching me formally how to do this. And we've done it since then with ClearPath, though I was actually already somewhat working this way. You know, when I explained that I was kind of working this method and working with the roles in the organization, I was already working with people to understand how they were doing their jobs. But this uh, this concept of master performers and the facilitated group process was definitely a trick of the trade that Guy passed along to us. And really, we just do this on autopilot. This is just how we work. So even just a couple of days ago, we were in breakout sessions, right, with client engagement managers at our current client doing this very thing because we're trying to put a performance-based um approach together for them that involves the data that they review and what they do with that in a client. And if you get in the room and one says, well, we use this data and the other says, well, we don't have that or we need a standard, that's where that happens. And so we do that. This is what we do every day. Or uh, another example is that we do a good bit of case study work. So we will work with an organization to say, if you want your group to be able to practice a real simulated situation, then let us look at the most current you know, business case study that a team has recently completed with one of your best customers, we'll work with those master performers to simulate all of the inputs, the outputs, the ex, you know the expected outcomes, et cetera. And this is just how we work typically. This is a very typical day at ClearPath. We are working with master performers because we're trying to replicate as much as we can about their real life into their learning so that it directly ties to their performance. Um, you asked a second question about uh, when pro when how to, how to avoid failing projects by using this method. We don't really consider that a project will ever fail if we take it on. So if we if we agree to take it on, it's not going to fail. However, we will say, and we do have many experiences where a client just wants us to create training. I'm going to use the air quotes training. We just want you to create a program. We need we need this content delivered as training. Can you do that? Okay. So we will do our best to, to ask the right questions and to ask for master performers always, right? We always start with that. Um, in the real world, sometimes if there's just, you know, we've set a deadline and we, we need this training and we're going to roll it out. Do you want to work with us or not? What we can do is what we say, right? What we can do is absolutely, we can take that content and we can build learning around that content. Um, you know, there's sometimes a focus around how many levels of the evaluation uh, are you, measurements are you going to hit? So what we can do is we can absolutely uh, provide learning that people enjoy and feel was worth their time. And we can absolutely test them on whether they've learned what we've built into this um, training or education. Uh, what we won't be able to do is align that with performance on the job. We won't be able to guarantee that, right? That will have to be the piece that you take business. And if it works for you, you take that piece. We will build what you need us to build. So there are times where we do have to manage these projects in a different way. If we either aren't able to get to master performers or the client just isn't open to that because they have different business drivers that are pushing this need. So we, you know, we run into all of these situations. Um, we don't let a project fail, but we do build those parameters around what we can do. And um, we always, you know, start first with performance and we try, um, you know, to lift that thinking up across all of our client interactions around, around that master performer mindset. Sometimes we have to throw in Guy Wallace's name and we do that and that helps usually. So we do what we can, always starting with performance. 
Thanks, Jen. I feel like there have been so many gifts in this video to folks that are either just starting out or are finding themselves with a new client and trying to work their way in and establish a good relationship that I, I, I've lost count by this point. Um, but I, uh, I, I'm, I'm loving everything that I'm hearing. Um, Guy, I'm, I, so, so we just heard a great tip from Jen uh, and I'm going to throw it back to you. And I, like I said, unpacking all the tips you've already shared is uh, more than we have time for, even in a recap. But maybe you could give us uh, something that you think would be very helpful to the folks who might just be starting their careers in learning and development now. Well, I, th I think the important thing is always to have that performance orientation, right? I mean, the, your your clients may ask you for learning or training or instruction, whatever their language is. But what well, you would need to unpack that and understand what it is that they're really trying to achieve. So the intake process, as it's sometimes called, when you first get a request, requires you to you know, do some active listening around that request so you understand what they're really looking for. What are the drivers? I have a saying that a request for instruction for new hires should be expected. A request for instruction to solve a performance problem should be suspected. Yet I believe that it's important that you uh, take the order. There's a lot of people who push back. We shouldn't be order takers. Well, no, you should take the order. And as I learned from the late Joe Harless back in the mid 80s, you should say, yes, I can help you. And and we can help you even more if we can do some analysis, what he called front-end analysis. There's many different names for these things, of course. And, and so, and you have to sell them on that. But, but so I would tell my clients, you know, I spent three years in the Navy, so I'd say, I always salute that request. I wouldn't do it that way if it were me, but I will salute your request and I will do what you're asking. And if I have a good relationship with them, they'll say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm glad that you're going to support me, but why is it that you wouldn't do that? You know, and that gives me a chance to talk with them about that. So we're talking about dealing with humans. And so we need to have a trusting relationship. And when you're in L&D and you're a service organization, you're there to support and serve other parts of the business. So it is not your job to push back because until you have some data, you don't know whether that's a valid request or not. So my approach to this is to say yes to the client, to do a project plan, and to present that project plan and negotiate with my client and or project steering team of stakeholders, you know, this is how this is how we're going to go forward and do this. Now, I always tell my clients when I meet with them, you have four options here at the end of this meeting. You can kill this project because it doesn't make any business sense. Two, you can defer it because it's not timely and we need to wait for something else to happen and then start it up again. Three, you can modify the approach of the project plan and then we can go forward. Or four, you can resource this and let's get going. And, and giving the client that command and control ability allows me to have that empowerment to really work with them. And so really the upfront everything from intake to project planning to kicking off a project is critical in getting the right resources for analysis and then design and then development or whatever model that you have for doing this. So working with people and, and serving their needs and not pushing back and saying that perhaps training isn't appropriate until you have analysis data, you don't know. And you, when you get done with the analysis efforts and you're reviewing the analysis data with the clients, they've reached what I call the L&D pivot point. This is where the client can pivot from an L&D effort to a non-L&D, a non-instructional effort to go solve what the analysis has uncovered. Perhaps the process is no good. It used to be good, but it's no longer any good for whatever reasons. Or the data and information people are working with is insufficient. Or the tools and equipment are inadequate. There's many variables to process performance and when we're focused on performance and the process, workflow, work streams, work processes, whatever, we can help our clients understand what's at the root of their need, of their problem and or opportunity. And 
if learning and development content isn't going to address that adequately, they need to do go do something else. And that's a business decision, not an L&D decision. So you take your client on the journey of the project, get them to see and review the analysis data, and they can come to a logical, rational conclusion as to whether or not they should pivot to a non-instructional effort or continue down the instructional route or do both. And how to do that? Do, does one go before the other? Do they go simultaneously uh, in sync? So these are different options for the client because they live with the consequences of us doing a good job or not on their behalf. This is not our LD project. It's the client's project. We're just the hired guns to come in and do that for them. And so people today need to work with their clients where they are, establish a trusting relationship. If that means going off and doing something that you know already isn't going to have an impact, it's going to have a negative ROI rather than a positive ROI, well, you have to make that decision. Do I resist this? Do I push back? Do I try to change the client's mind? Or do I work with them? And how do I tell them, if it was me, I wouldn't do that, but I'll do it for you? You know, th and this is tricky, and this is all depends on what kind of relationship you have with clients. When you're a consultant and you're working with somebody for the first time, you know, it's either your reputation or they don't know you from Adam, they were just referred to you by somebody else, and that's why you're in the room with them. Y you have to make a call there as to how do I deal with this situation? If the request doesn't seem quite right, how do I approach this? So my default would be agree to do this, insist on doing an analysis, insist on getting the right kinds of data uh, and resources for that analysis, and then let the, biz let the analysis data chips fall where they may and let the client review that and make a business decision about what to do. Because even if it learning, content isn't going to affect performance. If you've done a good job at analysis, you've pointed them in the right direction to make the fixes that they need in order to improve their business situation, because that's what it's really all about. It's about performance. It's not about learning. Even in a learning organization, it's all about performance. I, I A couple of things flashed through my mind. One of them was, uh, as we're nearing the end of this video, I'm loving that there has been so much to learn from you and from Jen, and at no point have we been talking about tools, right? Jen, I'm gonna invite you to go to the future and say, and answer the question, um, what does that hold for you and your team? And your turn also, um, do you have any advice that you'd like to share based on your journey or what you've learned from Guy that you think would be appropriate to someone who's, who's just making their way in this amazing field. Okay, let me see if I can tackle all that at once. Um, let's start with the present. I will start with the present and say that it's just been an amazing journey um, to lead and be a part of the ClearPath team. And I do want to acknowledge this team publicly on this podcast. This is not a one woman show here at ClearPath. I have the opportunity to be our voice box, which is what I am at home apparently too. I'm the voice box um, of the family. So sometimes you have that. Um, I'm I'm just wherever I am. I'm representing a team, and so I represent the team that is ClearPath. What we've learned, I loved what Guy said about uh, the right resources. So, you know, often a request that we'll get is, "Do you have an instructional designer who can come do this project for us, or do you have an instructional designer who can come and create this content that we need?" And that's a common request. We find that our, I'm going to give some advice to, to clients, to business owners out there often are coming looking for a resource, a resource, right? I see Guy is nodding in agreement here. Often businesses, because businesses shouldn't have to know the sausage making of learning and development. That's absolutely correct. But often there's this reach out for a resource when really you need the proper analysis and solution for a business problem and that actually takes multiple skill sets working together um, in a particular process or method to get to that. And so Guy was talking about the right resources for analysis, both from the, from the practitioner side, as well as from the business side, I would say. And then we also have people who specialize in that consulting and building that deep conversation with the client and understanding the master performer. And then we also have 
project managers, because these are projects that we're running and we need to show up and be able to work in a very efficient way like our clients. We have instructional designers, yes. We have graphic designers when we get into that fulfillment side of our work. So there is this ecosystem that we work in in the work that we do that is multiple skill sets that need to be brought together at the right time in the right context and you kind of massage that process all the way through and so there's incredible talent um working with and beside me at clearpath and we all do our pieces well i've always guy may remember i was a little bit of a rebel corporate manager because i managed to strengths versus trying to bring everybody's strengths and opportunities to the to the middle to be all the same I really tried to lead anyone who worked with me in their strengths. It's just a, it's a core belief of mine and how we work at ClearPath. The team members at ClearPath are all working in their strengths and together we can bring a client so much more than if they, if we just brought an instructional designer or a single, you know, learning experience designer in to a resource request. So wanted to say that also at present, we are not just a small intact core team. We are an intact core team growing with other partner teams that we work with. So if you're listening to this, you know, and you understand and appreciate the way that partnerships work, you also have such a great opportunity these days um, to partner with talent in, in different areas. And so we would never try to do everything that we do all on our own. We, we have a very active network of partnerships that we bring into the process, always always us as ClearPath representing the work to the client and we work as a team and we explain how that works. But um, the, just the, the, I can't, I can't overstate the importance of the skill sets, having the right people involved in the process at the right times and that it's, uh, that it is a process and it's somewhat of an ecosystem to do this right. Um, so that's that. Uh, any ad other advice that I would have? I, you know, I'm in a place in life where I get to meet many talented younger people who are coming through and college students and, you know, people who are wondering exactly what they're going to do with their lives. And so, you know, kind of going back on my story, I didn't have a specific plan in mind, but if you plan to work in business and you plan to support business in any way, it's back to what you were just saying in your summary really seek to understand the business, okay? And what Guy was saying about our clients don't want to hear L&D jargon could not be truer. It could not be more true. And I think that what our clients see in us at ClearPath is a partner that is able now, after working years across industries, we're able to quickly do that pattern matching and in a few brief conversations, understand their business and speak it back to them, right? Be able to speak back to your client, their business, before you try to suggest anything that you can bring to solve for their business. That's the most important way to build that, to build that client relationship. Um, future. So I'll try to answer the future question. I don't have a crystal ball. I have uh, never been able to predict the future. So, um, I say we keep doing what we're doing well. Um, I can tell you that interestingly, we have now, now we are approached more often than ever by other companies in our industry and also by clients to do that upfront strategy piece, to do that deep analysis, to do the blueprinting of what the need really is. And sometimes that work is a project in and of itself and it, it, and it and it unveils to the client that, oh, okay, this is really important information and now we can go do this ops process optimization first and then we'll build the right learning to support the performance. And that is happening often for us at ClearPath. We joke about possibly rebranding, you know, ClearPath beyond learning or something, you know, something because, uh, because we did start as a learning company and we do, that is at the core of what we do, but the deeper we get with our customers, we are now sometimes supporting, you know, competency mapping and doing that KSA work, the knowledge and skills analysis and deep documentation like Guy talks about. You're not to learning yet, right? You're doing all the pieces that precede that, that tell you, that prescribe what the learning needs to be. Um, so we are very fortunate now in the present, and I think this is where we'll go more in the future, that we are actually being sought out in our industry and from others um, to really be to be advisors in the business problem, right? Helping our clients solve their business problems 
And then where we are experts is in the people side of that. So once we unveil, you know, what the people need to be able to do their jobs, then we can move more into fulfillment of those people solutions. So I just, I see us doing more of that. Um, I, that's my hope. Um, that's what we love to do. And um, you mentioned we're not really talking that much about tools and products. I did want to speak to that because the world is changing quickly. And, you know, every other LinkedIn post is about AI and all of that. So absolutely, we stay informed, we stay educated, and we stay, you know, grounded in what we do well and also applying what our learners and our and our and our clients are needing. I would say the buzzwords now in the space where we are is upskilling and reskilling, right? Because the jobs are changing. So what this job looked like even just two years ago now in a particular client that we're serving is very different. So if we stay focused on what the performance looks like, even as those tools and the technology changes and some of the work becomes automated or some of the work, you know, it gets done a different way. As long as people are here, that's where we'll be. So in the future, if you're looking for us, that's where we'll be. That's a great future. I like that future. Um, Jen, uh, I'm really glad you you brought all of those points into your answer. I think those are all really key key things to take away from this conversation. Um, and we're just about out of time. So I'm gonna give each of you a chance to uh, see if you can come up with a, a single sentence takeaway. You know, from the time that we've spent together, the three of us, from the time that you imagine learners in the future and business owners in the future are going to be watching this video. Guy, if you had to give them a one sentence takeaway of, you know, something you want them to remember, what would that be? Uh, I'll be a little bit redundant here or reinforcing, as it were. Uh, focus on those performance requirements of the learners back on the job and enable their competence to do that. Competencies. Excellent. Jen, I'll give you that same question before we wrap up. Okay. Um, learn from your mentors and help your clients pursue performance. I stole those words from Guy. Thank you both for sharing some of your insights and experiences in the field of learning and development with our audience. And thanks to our viewers for watching this program and choosing to learn with us today. Be sure to drop us a comment to let us know what you enjoyed and if you have any questions for Guy or Jen. And if you have any suggestions for future videos you'd like to see, we'd love to hear from you. As Jen likes to say, whatever path you're on, let's work together to make it a clear path to success. I'm James Gilchrist, and we'll see you in the next one.